W420RadioNetwork.com. Well, the biggest industry in the world for cannabis is in California. $3 billion last year. Unfortunately, 80% of that is in the black market. And we're joined by Alex Traverso, the Assistant Chief of Communications in the Bureau of Cannabis Control. So it's great that cannabis is legal. It's unfortunate that four-fifths of the cannabis consumed in California is not legal. Right. And that's, you know, I think that was to be expected when we started out. I think every state that's legalized before California has had a problem with the illegal market. Our situation is a little unique in the fact that, you know, when medical cannabis was legalized back in 1996, that there wasn't any rules around it. So you had all these operators out there that were that were a medical cannabis establishment that didn't just go away when Prop 64 passed. They're still there. Right. So these are people who have been operating for two decades that suddenly it's you know, you have to close your doors, and, and a lot of them aren't going to do that. So it, it's, it's, a, it's been a big challenge for us. Yeah, and the fact that 70% of municipalities do not even allow for cultivation or dispensaries in California. So now you're really behind the eight ball. Right, so you're talking, you're just, you just basically described our two main challenges is, is local control and, and the illegal market. And those two kind of work in concert because again, when, when Prop 64 was passed, that gave the local jurisdictions the chance to just ban things entirely. And in those areas, just because you ban things doesn't mean there's not operators operating. So um, it's really a challenge in getting some of those bans to be lifted so we have more opportunities for people to get licensed. Yeah, and then one of the uh, paradoxes is that with testing and with all the bureaucratic constraints, that adds to the cost. You've excise taxes, you've got uh, a variety of taxes that boost the price of legal marijuana mm -hmm. versus the black market, which doesn't have to deal with that, but you don't know what you're getting right. in, the, in the black market. Yeah, and I think that's, I think that's one of our, that's one of our um, main issues right now is trying to do more in the way of consumer education, right? So you have a chance to tell people, here is the clear difference between illegal operator and legal operator and the things that they go through and the fact that the products are tested, they're safe. And that's really what we're trying to convey to people, especially when you see, you know, this vape crisis where people are getting sick. That was almost the, you know, if there was a silver lining in that, it's that we can point to that and say, well, this is this is exactly why you need to go to a legal operator to get your products, because you can feel comfort in knowing that these products are safe and they've been through testing. Yeah, well, talk about that, because we all know seed to sale is the big battle cry for legal marijuana, that you know exactly what you're getting. Well, what are the variables when you get it on the, on the black market and, and how stringent is the testing to make sure that what you purchase in the dispensary is the purest cannabis that you can find? Right. So on the testing front, I mean, your, your cannabis products are tested more than most of the food that we eat. I mean, it's, it's, it's gone through a more stringent testing than the food we're actually putting in our bodies. So on that front, you can feel safe about it. But then when you go to the illegal market, I mean, as we've seen recently, we, we just did an enforcement effort in, in Southern California and we served 45 search warrants. We took a random sampling of the products that we took out of those places. We brought it in for testing. More than 75% of the products we tested failed testing. A lot of them, the vape cartridges had vitamin E in there. These are the things that are making people sick. So um, it's the evidence is really overwhelming that, you know, when you go to a, an illegal shop, um, you, you're not, you, you know, you may be, you may be paying less, but what's the ultimate long-term cost of that, right? I mean, and, and as it relates to your health and well-being, so yeah. that's really what the picture we're trying to paint for people right now. Yeah, but sadly, the business contraction be, because of the costs, mm -hmm. the taxes, the cumbersome restrictions in municipalities that are not in my house, not in my backyard, making it more challenging for entrepreneurs cannabis uh, businessmen to make it happen. So what what are the, the ensuing maybe incentives or what are you doing to make it more viable for people who want to get in the industry? Yeah, I mean, I think you, you look at it from a lot of different angles. So first and foremost, for us at the Bureau of Cannabis Control, we have to look at our regulations on a regular basis and see what, what, what are we asking of, of folks? Can we make things more streamlined? Can we make things easier? Can we be more flexible? What are some changes we can make to make business operators, um, their lives a little easier? And then you got to look at the next level and you got to look at, okay, how is the industry going to organized to try to get some changes legislatively that they need because there are things that we can't in, that are in statute that we can't touch but a legislative fix can can help them so it's about also trying to really get the industry to organize and to come together on some big ticket items that could be fixed uh, through the legislative process and ultimately signed by the governor yeah now you talk about 
the, as I mentioned, the excise tax, 10%, the cultivation tax, there's other taxes, and the dual licensing system, yep. municipal and state. This gets really cumbersome. And then you've got three organizations overseeing the industry in California, Department of Food and Ag, Department of Public Health, Fish and Wildlife, mm-hmm. Bureau of Cannabis Control, which is your bailiwick. But consolidation is in the works. And what's, what's the uh, timeline for that? And what do you hope that streamlining will bring to the industry? So this is, uh, so consolidation, I think first and foremost, I'd like to say that I think that, that the fact that we're embarking down this road is a sign that the, this administration, that the Newsom administration is, is very vested in this industry succeeding. And so I think that they're taking a look at, not only, not only are they gonna take a look at the tax and the way that the taxes are formulated and, and put on these businesses, but also with consolidation, one of the main things we heard from day one was, you know, why are we the only state that has three licensing entities, right? A lot of people have multiple licenses where they're going to touch on each agency. So what we're doing now, and work has already started, and ultimately by, I think it's July of 2021, we're going to have one Department of Cannabis Control where you come for everything, one-stop shop. And so right now what you're seeing is work groups happening where we're talking about the ways that we're going to bring everything together. How do we, how do we consolidate our regulations, our communications teams, our HR, everything, right? So, so there's a lot of work to be done between now and, and that date in 2021. Now, obviously, you're also probably very closely watching what's going on in Washington with the Safe Banking Act passing the House now before the Senate, because that's also holding back industries in each state, in California, the leader. So tell me what the, what the trends are and what you, what you expect on the horizon with that, because if I'm going into business and it's only, you know, it's a cash, uh, you know, fuel business and I, and I can't park it, and I can't move it and I can't go interstate, that's going to be a hindrance. Right. And I think, I think ultimately the main, I think the main takeaway is eventually we got to get to a point where we have federal legalization because so much in the way of what we've already talked about, whether it's taxes, whether it's, you know, the fees that are on businesses, the fact that they can't bank, the fact that they can't even operate like a regular business and have bit tax write-offs, right? They don't, they can't even claim business expenses. I mean, these are things like if, if we, if we had federal legalization, a lot, the banking issue and the tax issue, that, that would go away immediately. And, and automatically operators would, you know, then the then the licensing fees become less important because they they can finally write off their business expenses and operate like a true business. Um, so I think that as far as our, I mean, we always keep an eye on what other states are doing, and, and you know, we try to solve these big problems. But I mean, we've we've also gone down that road with banking before, where it's not just going to happen overnight, and and the solutions are not are not there in California just yet. You know, how does the legalization of hemp federally in America? influence the prospect of getting a national yeah. cannabis agenda. I think it. I think it. I think anything like that helps. I mean, I think it, it starts to it starts to normalize the industry, right? And then people aren't people aren't afraid of it anymore. And so we we're, we're making these moves with hemp, and the hope is that that opens the door for cannabis as well. Because the fact that you and I'm just going to say this: the fact that you still treat cannabis as a Schedule One drug, the same as heroin, the same as, it's it's absurd, right? And that's I, I believe that everybody feels that same way because you're you're basically saying that cannabis has no medical benefits. And what you're hearing at, at a conference like this is people up on stage saying it does right that they're they have real life experience of it helping helping their their health so um i think that i think federal legalization of hemp i think hopefully opens a door and we can get there hopefully sooner all right so gavin newsom powerful governor of california advocate for prop 64 which passed in two years ago his advocacy on a national level, how influential do you think that is going to be? Because usually if it happens in California, it happens first and that paves the way, kind of pioneering a variety of societal you know, yeah. uh, trends and the like. You know, I think I think you know. I always say that this is it's better that uh, California was not first to legalize that we that we did have some data to look at in other states, Washington, Oregon, especially Colorado, um, so we could see some of the pain points. Um, but California is very unique, and I think the governor's advocacy and really taking a lead on this issue is is going to help us get over some of these uh, the bumps that we've seen in the road. And so I think this year is going to be huge for the industry because I think the governor is very invested, and I think you're going to see some big things happen this year. You know, in, in regards to licensing. You you talk about provisional as a, as a prelude, but just give us an idea. I'm an entrepreneur. I want to get in the industry. How challenging is it? How costly is it now? And how could that be ameliorated down the road if there are advancements in, well, streamlining the system and kind of 
reducing the bureaucracy, if you will, yeah. to take a chunk out of that black market, which is taking 80 percent of, of the cannabis revenue. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a lot of things that need to happen. We need to continue to enforce against the illegal market. We've got to put a dent in the illegal market because that's the only way that, that legal operators are going to have the ability to fully stand up. We've got to continue to uh, lower the cost for entry. It's too expensive for people right now. There's not enough options as far as jurisdictions are concerned. We need to do more in the way of working with local jurisdictions to get them over the hump. Figure out what what are their barriers? Why are they not? Why why is it just they want to ban it forever, or are they is something what's what's holding them back? Um, and we need to do more in the way of trying to bridge that gap. Um, but ultimately, I think, and I tell this to everybody, you know, if, if I'm a if I'm someone who's been in the industry operating for 20 plus years, and I'm, I've, I've got this way of thinking about the way things were, and you come in with money, and you think I've got an opportunity here, you're going to have an easier time than I am because you because you're just going to say, okay, give me the rules, and I'll just follow them. I have this institutional knowledge and a way of doing things that I can't. I just can't get over that mental barrier. Like I can't. I can't. I can't figure out how to operate in this new reality. So I think that's that's a lot of what we're seeing right now. Yeah, and the fact that it's such a fluid uh, industry in the sense that what's legal today is challenged tomorrow and the right. you know the rules change the game changes just when i get a handle on one thing uh there, there are modifications yep. so that makes it even more challenging and does that benefit the big pharma industries that are jumping in and, and tobacco own tobacco companies that are owning cannabis mm -hmm. entities today is it more advantageous for them or are we kind of playing the big man's hand rather than the, the small entrepreneur you know, I don't, I don't know that, as much about that, but I think, I think really what we all are focused on on a regular basis is, is how do we, we have to, we have to preserve these legacy operators, these people who paved the road to get here. We can't lose them. I mean, they're, these are the people that, they're the backbone of this industry. So we have to figure out ways to get them through this sort of turbulent period and onto the other side. So we have a, a balance of small, medium, large operators. And that's, I think that was the goal ultimately is there's a place for everybody. Um, and so we, you know, on the work we do on a regular basis, a lot of it is, is figuring out how do we, how do we make a business environment where, where everyone can survive. Well, and thrive. And, and thrive. we're on our way, but yeah. it's been a slow and arduous process. Thanks so much for your time. Alex Traverso, the Assistant Chief of Communications, the Bureau of Cannabis Control. I'm Rich Walcuff on the W420 Radio Network. W420RadioNetwork.com.